<laughs> hey, welcome to Hindsight, the podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones, and I'm thrilled to embark on this journey of exploration with you. We often find ourselves reflecting on the choices we've made and wondering how our lives might have unfolded differently if we had taken a different path. Here's the beauty of hindsight. It gives us a chance to gain wisdom and learn from our past decisions. Look, this podcast is a platform to dig deep into those pivotal moments and uncover the invaluable lessons hidden within. <laughs> Look, I'm Lee Jones, your host, and I couldn't be more excited to have you on board. So let's dive right in and explore the fascinating realm of decisions on Hindsight the Podcast. When you look back in hindsight, everything is 2020. In hindsight, we make mistakes we're learning from. This. In hindsight, it should be your today and your tomorrow. In hindsight, it's so much clearer now. This is Hindsight the Podcast, and introducing your host, Lee Jones. Hey, welcome to Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones, and today my guest is Kevin. Dunlap, a true powerhouse in the world of entrepreneurship and education. As the founder of Optimal Performance Academy, he's a go-to expert for entrepreneurs and small business owners. From his U.S. Navy days stationed in Japan to his journey as a math teacher and beyond, Kevin's story is a tale of dedication. He made his mark in real estate, authored three books, and recently penned a guide on business launch strategies. Kevin's Academy helps entrepreneurs navigate the business landscape without being overwhelmed. His aim to guide a thousand businesses to the six figure mark and beyond. Let's get to it. On your feet. <laughs> that's a that's a military joke. Welcome. How you doing, Kevin Dunlap? I'm doing well, Lee. How, how about yourself? I'm doing good. I'm doing pretty good. Thank you so much. We had a little uh, uh, technical details at the beginning of this before this uh, episode got started and and Kevin put his skills right to the test and gave me some strategies on how I can better the communication with my guests going forward so Kevin I just want to say thank you first and foremost uh, for those tips those free tips by the way uh, that you <laughs> helped me out along the way uh, it's my pleasure and I always like to check links uh, before I you know I get on a show or or, or be a guest. Uh, and usually an hour of four, and it, so that gives me time to um, correct them if something was wrong. <laughs> and I'm glad I did this time. Hey, so Kevin, tell us a little bit about yourself. I went very vaguely. Uh, I did touch on the Navy thing. I'm I'm an Army guy. Uh, I retired okay. from the Army a few years back. Uh, so go go Army, right? <laughs> but tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, yes, uh, I grew up in a, in a small town uh, just outside of Pensacola, Florida. So I, I fully understand what it was like to come from a small town. Uh, we had one red light in two grocery stores. <laughs> and the Piggly Wiggly is still there, by the Piggly way. Wiggly. <laughs> Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> what a name um, for a grocery store, but I love it. I, I love it. And actually, uh, I went off topic here, but I saw uh, this uh, a day in, in the museum or something, uh, you know, that TV show that goes into the history of something. Piggly yeah. Wiggly is actually known to, uh, to, uh, to make, uh, they changed the world. How's that? Before Piggly Wiggly, when you walk into a store, you go up to the clerk behind the register and tell them what you want. And that, and that clerk would go th and get things off the shelf. Piggly Wiggly actually said, you know what, let's give people baskets and uh, have them get their own stuff off the shelves. So they were the first store to do that, by the way. The pioneers of the modern day uh, supermarket experience. That's awesome. I didn't know that. I did not know that either until, that, until I saw that episode. But anyway, going back to your, your original question. Um, yeah, I grew up in a small town, and, and then I was very anxious to get out uh, out of town. Uh, so, you know, like a lot of uh, young men and women, for that matter, uh, I joined the U.S. Navy uh, on the same year that I got out of high school. I actually was going in the Navy within like a month of getting out of high school. But my recruiter um, asked me if I would uh, would wait until November so they can get somebody else to take my spot because that person was about to reach their, their one year maximum. So I ended up going in November of the same year I graduated high school. And that actually one of the things that changed my life. I traveled the world, saw 14 countries. I, you know, I was able to you know, see them. I, I was able to see other countries not only for free, but to get paid to go see those countries because, you know, oh. being a military. Yeah. And, I, I, let me let me chime in real quick. I used to love those trips as well. So go ahead. 
<laughs> well, yeah, yeah, because and the thing is, when you when a young impressionable man, you know, from a small town, uh, is now, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in Korea, I'm in I'm in Japan, I'm in China, I'm in you know, all these other countries. You start to get the experience of how other people live, and it helps you to appreciate other people's uh, other people's uh, cultures and things along those lines. And I think that was one of the first parts of my journey. Um, after getting out, of course, I went, to, I went to college, went to grad school, uh, got a degree in uh, mathematics, went to study meteorology as a um, uh, as a subject, then was a computer programmer. Um, and I mean, and then in 1999, I was working on a on the Y2K project, and then my and I was finishing up one gig, one subcontracting gig, and I took my uh, two week vacation uh, in June. Came back and a few weeks after I got back, my boss said we cannot find you in any other gigs. And by the way, we're going to let you go. Oh, oh! In that second week of vacation, since you since you took it in the middle of the year, we're taking that out of your final paycheck. Oh my goodness! And, and therefore, I got kind of turned off to, to corporate America. <laughs> um, I, so I swore I would never work uh, full time for corporate America again. I did work a little bit uh, part time jobs as a college math teacher. I was also doing, and this is so, my life is so varied. And as I, and I was also doing uh, part-time stunt work for film and then a, a fight choreographer for stage. So, so I have that experience as well. That led me to starting um, my first, uh, to start investing in real estate. I moved to Las Vegas ended up in, in 2004, ended up starting a real estate consult- consultation business where I was helping other uh, owners uh, to find higher quality tenant buyers for, for their homes through a lease option program that I created. And that led me to becoming a realtor. And that, and that was 18 years of my life right there, just doing that. And now after writing my fourth book, which came out last year, which was basically on um, how to start a business. Um, I decided in, when I moved from Las Vegas to Raleigh in, in March of 22 that I would actually start a, a business where I would teach other entrepreneurs. So I, so that's when I formed Optimal Performance Academy. And the academy is basically is a school that I'm building. We have a number of online co- courses. We're constantly adding more courses uh, uh, every single couple of weeks. I have a uh, group and private uh, consultation services. Uh, we have workshops that we're doing and we have a uh, live trainings, live free trainings that we're doing. I have a classroom that recorded. That's that is the uh, the recording of all those live trainings that I've done. So if you ever want to go back and re listen to it again, you can or, or listen to ones that you may have missed because you're out of town or you didn't know about us yet. Um, and, and that's exactly what we're doing right now, man. I'll tell you what, I'm <laughs> I'm listening to all the different things you've done, uh, especially the stunt, you know, yes. the, 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 the stunt uh, crew stuff. I don't know what you call it, but you was a stunt man, right? <laughs> stunt man, stunt coordinator, mainly for independent films, for you know, low, low budget independent films. And then because uh, my original training in stunts was was when I lived in Raleigh in 98, 99. Yeah. And uh, and I learned uh, uh, stage combat. And that was mainly mainly it was with weapons like uh, like a, a rapier and a dagger or a quarter staff and then hand to hand combat. You know, how, how do you throw a punch on stage to make to sell that it was a punch um, where the audience would like, did he really just hit that guy? And, and of course, we're doing it safely because we're, we're missing each other by several inches because of the way that just the way that, that we throw the punch. And right. they say, and there's a lot of plays that have uh, fights in them. I mean, my two biggest plays was uh, Hamlet and Macbeth. I always wanted to get involved in in some sort of film creation or just be a part of it. Right. It just looks kind of cool. Right. And then to be able to see yourself on screen, I think is, would probably be an amazing thing. Or if you're a stuntman. You see that you see Tom Cruise fall down those stairs. That's not Tom Cruise. That's a stuntman. That's not like, yeah. Like, no. Yeah, that's not Tom. I did that thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. This is hindsight the podcast, and thank you for going back a little bit. But looking back, what's a specific mm-hmm. failure that surprisingly became a turning point for your career and life's trajectory? And how did it set you on a new path? Now, you gave one example about how they just did you wrong. At, the, at that company, just let you go, right? Um, yep. And that kind of put some things in motion, right? Uh, you had some time in the Navy, which gave you different perspectives. And and I wholeheartedly agree with you. When you go to these different locations, it can be different states in this country, right? But when you also add in other countries, 
in your travels and you get to understand the different cultures and how people are, right? You have a better appreciation of reality or you start to reform your idea of what reality is, right? Just because you've been a part of those experiences. Um, so that is one thing that I definitely credit, you know, the good and the bad with the military, uh, being deployed in a, in a combat zone or, or just training exercise or just going to a country and supporting some, some sort of mission. All of those experiences for me culminated into uh, a sort of socialization that helped me to better sharpen my idea of what reality is. Does that make any sense? Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, what, if you want, I'll just share one of the one of my early uh, biggest uh, big mistakes that actually um, became one of the best things that ever happened to me. There you go. Um, it was uh, when I joined the Navy back in uh, back when uh, in eighty five when I joined. I joined under the nuclear power program. And at that time, that was the most prestigious program outside of SEALs, you know, outside of the special, you know, special forces stuff. But that was one of the most prestigious programs that the whole military had at that time. And after I got a, a basic training, some people call it boot camp. After I got a, a basic training, I was going to my, in my schooling to get my education on the subject that I was going to be talking, uh, doing. In that case, I was, it didn't really matter what it was. Uh, and then after I finished that schooling, I would go to Nuke Power School. Well, um, an incident happened. This was, was in Waukegan, Illinois, uh, which is right next, right uh, next to the Great Lakes um, uh, na- Navy base there. Is a, 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 an incident happened that actually put me, this was an Easter weekend of, of, of 1986. Uh, something happened that actually put me, I was detained by the police un, until Monday morning when I had a hearing. Um, I was let go of one of the one of the uh, one of the charges, and the other charge uh, they convicted me of a hundred fifty dollar fine, and I went back to uh, I went back to base. Well, basically, well, being in jail is no reason that you you're not at your duty station. So I had to go to captain's mass uh, because of that. And the out of the six out of the seven people that were at captain's mass at the time that I went, I went I was number six in line. The five in front of me were a reduced uh, a restriction to bay, a re- restriction to the ship, as well as a, redu- a reduction in rate and, and a fine. This judge or this captain uh, basically said, said, "We'll let you go. Don't let it happen again." And then the, the last guy got redu- reduction in rate and <laughs> and a fine. Um, and so I, I had to file a what they call a CHIT, a C H I T, to stay in the nuclear power program. Well, I will go ahead and finish my A school, and I graduated with an 89.6 GPA. I have to have a 90 GPA. I go, well, I only missed like one or two, two, two questions on the final exam. I'll just put in another chit to stay in nuclear power school. And they say, we have a hard rule. You cannot have two chits. You're now out of nuclear power school. The whole reason I joined the Navy. And now it's like, what am I going to do for the next four years of my life um, when the whole reason I joined the Navy was for this? So I was put into what they call TPU or temporary processing unit because they had no idea where to send me. Because uh, at that time, they're like, you're supposed to be going to new power school, but now you're not going there. We don't know what to do with you. Um, so about three months go by before I got my orders uh, to, uh, to, go, uh, to go to the ship, uh, to go to my ship. And that ship happened to be in Yokosuka, Japan. So that started two years of, um, of my first ship in Japan. And then my second ship, because I started time to serve, uh, was, uh, was I decided to stay in, in Yokosuka and, st- and ended up uh, living in Japan on two different ships for four years. Mm. So that, if I would have gone to nuclear power school at that time, nuclear ships were not, uh, were not ported in any foreign country. They were, could only be in the United States. So now I now look at that it's like that night, you know, that night that I got arrested, it was a bad night uh, because of that. And, it, you know, it, it kind of caused me to get out of the nuclear power program. But it also it was the, uh, the catalyst that changed my life forever for, you know, being able to experience other, cor- other cultures and living with other uh, people from other countries. So I, I look at that as like that was a that was a great turning point. Even oh, though at the goodness. time you're like, what am I going to do? What am I going to exactly. do? <laughs> I mean, imagine me put in jail. I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, a, a young kid uh, in you know in Ch- just outside of Chicago, uh, uh, being in jail in a dormitory uh, jail. So I'm sharing a room with 35, 40 other people that are in there for all kinds of different reasons. Right, right. right. And I'm there by myself. <laughs> I tell you what, 
and and this is probably not a reflection of the Navy and the Army. I recall uh, one time we had a formation in the morning and the commander got up and one of the guys had been arrested over the weekend, but four or five of them had went out and was at a bar party. And I think they went to, to Canada or something. And so the messaging from, from our commander was pretty funny. Uh, not really funny, but his, <laughs> his perspective was, why did I go and pick up one of you from jail for fighting and five of you all went out there. So it's either none or all of you, right? If one person gets into a fight, everybody gets into a fight and everybody should get arrested. And I was like, what kind of unit am I in? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in a, I was in a light infantry unit. I'm a supply person. Right. And I was assigned to a, a light infantry unit out in uh, upstate New York at Fort Drum. And it's just, it's just a funny uh, mentality. So I just wanted to share that. You made me think about that when you talked about the arrest. So when you were in Japan, you explored on those two ships, you explored 14 countries in, in that time period. Yes. And I, and I'm, and I, and my Navy people uh, may know this, uh, the rest of your listeners may not, but I am what they call a, um, uh, a shellback. And what that means is I've gone through this. It's a Navy ritual that you go through. And this kind of disgusting ritual uh, where was that if you when you cross the equator, uh, the people that have not crossed the equator are called wogs. And I, so I was fortunate to uh, to actually participate in that that ritual. So I, I do. I'm an honorable shellback. I've actually crossed the equator twice. And when I say Twice, I mean, the first time we crossed and then we came back, and the second time we crossed and we came back. So technically, it's four times, but you only you only talking about when you're going from north to south as crossing the equator. All right, I'd be a terrible host if I didn't ask you to elaborate on this disgusting ritual that you just mentioned. So, what happens once you cross cross the equator? Okay, so number one, you are that they strongly suggest that you get two sets of, of knee pads because you're going to be on, on your hands and knees the entire day or uh, during the entire ritual, which is going to last about four or five hours. Uh, so if you've ever been on ship before, you got that non skid paint that's mm-hmm. going to spare your, your feet and hands up. Uh, that's, why, that's why they suggest you get knee pads. Mm-hmm. Um, you, they, uh, some people will get old, uh, old fire hoses. They will, they will go ahead and get like a three foot length. They will uh, t- tape off one end for a handle and then they soak it in salt water, water for weeks. So it becomes very, very hard and you're going to get spanked with that thing. You're going to get spanked quite often with that thing. Um, you are going to also have to do that. Uh, each department has a, what they call a, um, I forget the name of it, a, a, a wog queen. So one, one guy in the department is going to have to dress up like a woman with makeup and everything and <laughs> perform in front of the, all the other showbacks. And there's also going to be a wog dog. <laughs> oh, my so goodness. That's, and, and then, I mean, I've got pictures of when <laughs> when I was a uh, showback when uh, the, uh, those wogs were going through. You are also going to be jumping into a vat or a a huge vat, like, you know, 10 foot vat, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. disgusting water filled with all kinds of rotten food. You got to swim across it. Um, so, so technically at the end of the day, um, what all the wogs do is once they're done is that they will strip down to their underwear and they throw their clothes overboard because they're, 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 they can't be cleaned. <laughs> it's just that far gone. Oh my so, goodness. <laughs> that lasts for hours. <laughs> I tell you what, I was like I said, I was in the army, and so we didn't go to ships to go to Japan. I did fly to Japan a couple times, and uh, thankfully, we had to remain uh, seated with our uh, was it trays uh, locked up in in, in <laughs> whatever the hell the message is that the the stewardesses and them tell you, right? So we we just flew in and then we flew back. We didn't have to, you know, go through uh, this disgusting. Ceremony <laughs> that you all had to go People through. That's pretty Google cool. It. Good. Say a uh, 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 shellback ritual uh-huh. uh, 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 on Google. They see if there's all kind of images that that, that gets pulled up. And shellback you know, ritual. I, I'm just guessing that's what it would be. Now, here's the funny thing: on my second ship when we crossed, yeah. the XO was a sh- uh, was a wog. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that don't know what that means, that means the executive officer or the second in command. <laughs> the second in command, absolutely. And every no, <laughs> I guess no one's exempt, huh? 
Nobody's exempt. Now they were more friendly with him. They were, he, of course. He, <laughs> yeah, he still got to rate you. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> All right. So you've done a lot of things. And from a math teacher to a real right. estate entrepreneur to founding Optimal Performance Academy, Academy, I'm sorry, your journey spans on all the other things in between. So can you shed light on a misstep that uh, led you to an innovative solution or an opportunity you wouldn't have otherwise discovered? One, you failed that test by a couple of points, right? So that mm-hmm. definitely gave you an opportunity to get on those ships and get that beautiful experience over in, in Japan. But other than that, do you have any other missteps? Well, I mean, there's always going to be uh, missteps. I mean, uh, I know in like in 2004, I, is, that's when I moved to Vegas in January of four, and um, and I and it was about I don't know six months later that that I started uh, my real estate consulting business, uh, doing the lease options. Mm-hmm. Now I was working with another group of people that were investors that were doing uh, seller financing type properties. And they were in, and they were part of a company called a Nouveau Riche. They were the Las Vegas branch. And out of the seven people, none of them lived in Vegas. So I became their uh, their their go to uh, local person. And um, but then they folded, and then I started. Uh, I, but I still had that network of investors. So that's when I started my lease option uh, consultation uh, business. Now that at least option because we were actually having people buy a uh, people that could not uh, uh, buy a house. We were having them, um, uh, you know, I would put them under contract, find an investor to buy the house, uh, add twenty five percent to that on a one year contract because housing markets were going up 40 percent at that time. And uh, and then of course there was that housing crunch that completely destroyed my business. Like how do you buy, have a business where somebody buys a house and then they're going to add a property to that so that the investor you know, know, uh, makes money on it whenever, when everything's dropping 10, 15, 20, 30, even 50%. So that, I mean, for me, I had to completely change my business model. I had to completely change how I was doing things. Um, it was, it was a difficult uh, transition. Um, but you know, I figured something out and, and it took me, you know, almost being uh, bankrupt, um, mm. uh, when that happened. I mean, I, re- I still, I still remember, um, back in 07 when all that was going on, I lost my own personal house to, to foreclosure because I just couldn't make the payments anymore. So I, but the thing is I learned from that. And I also, I, you know, I can, I can feel for somebody if they're losing their home, the foreclosure, because I, not only did I lose my house, but I lost like four other, uh, four other properties, either, either to short sales or, um, or to foreclosure. So that would affect my credit for several years, like nearly a decade. Right. Wow. Well, it was because I was I was keeping on one house, and then, so when my last house that finally went uh, uh, you know went away, that was like four years uh, later. So that that six year seven year clock of that foreclosure being on your credit port, you know, every, when it finally left, I I got down on my knees and thank God, thank you for taking this house because instead of looking at it as a, as a negative, I looked at it as a, now the clock starts, so I can actually buy something new in a few years. That's how I looked at it. So did the did the market crash in the subsequent ending of your business there, did that prompt your move to Raleigh? What what made you, why did you move to Raleigh? Well, that's another interesting story. Um, in September of 2021, my dad was uh, was in a hospital uh, with a, a with a UTI. And, uh, and my brothers and I uh, were thinking about uh, having him go into assisted living because we didn't feel like he could really fully take care of himself in, anymore. And he had just, you know, and my uh, younger brother had convinced him to sell his his tool business, which happened to be uh, on the other side of the state line in Lower Alabama. And uh, I think it was Somerdale or something like that. And he and he sold the business. So he sold the business and all the tools that he had in the store. And then he had a, a little shop or a little storage unit uh, uh, right next to this uh, store that, uh, that the buyer got that as well. But he still had five warehouses of tools back in back in Pensacola. So I went there to say, like, well, we got to find an assisted living uh, facility. And then like, well, if he goes, then we've got to sell all of these tools as well. Um, so, you know, I was going through the process of, you know, trying to organize things. And the week after I had arrived, my dad passed away. Um, that prompted me to start to question about, you know, maybe I should move back to Raleigh, uh, to the Raleigh area. And I, you know, and my, I've got a brother in D.C., another brother in uh, Birmingham. And I was like, well, I lived in Raleigh before and maybe this would be a good time to maybe check it out. 
I didn't, I didn't do anything about that. I, I ended up back in Vegas and what happened between there, that's a completely another story that we might talk about. Um, and then I flew back in January 22 to sell his house, his truck and his, uh, and the contents of his, uh, of his house. And so I bought a one way ticket because I don't know how long it's going to be. And I, and I figured I had to be in Pensacola for, you know, to sign the closing docs. So I bought, bought a one way ticket and, you know, staying at my dad's house. And I got somebody to sell this uh, stuff, and then I bought a one-way ticket uh, a week, uh, a few weeks later, to uh, to come check out Raleigh. This was mid February. I drove around and just saw, just saw how green this city is, which is a lot different than Las Vegas. And I, uh, you know, I was looking around. And I said, well, maybe let me go try to find places to live. And they've got the they've got the yoga studios that I like. They've they've got co working spaces. They got all this other stuff. And it's a, and it's a, a green city. And it's kind of halfway between my two brothers. And uh, so I was, went and started looking at a, at uh, apartments because you know I didn't I didn't want to buy and uh, at that point because I didn't know Raleigh uh, in order to just buy something you know willy nilly. And then you know I ended up finding a place that I liked. I signed a lease and I had to you know my my lease started March first or actually it started March twenty or February twenty fifth. And um, then you know I uh, ended up uh, two weeks later I moved to Raleigh. <laughs> so, and I mean, I, I like it here. It is a very green state, and I've seen my brothers uh, uh, more frequently now than I did when I was living in Vegas. Because I mean, how often are you going to fly out to Vegas? But you know, my younger brother is only a four-hour drive away instead of you know three time zones. I, I I can appreciate your uh, recognizing how green it is. Uh, leaving Southern California, which is beautiful, right? But it's still dry. It's it's not as as, as vibrant. I'm from Maryland. So I'm okay. very familiar with the East Coast, but I've been here in California for about 11, 12 years now. And uh, I tell you what, going back east, going south, you know, <laughs> any of those places other than here, it's just it has its own charm. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Well, there are uh, plus and minuses. One thing I do miss after living in Vegas for 18 years is I miss living in the Pacific time zone. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> Like if you want to watch a football game uh, and it starts at seven o'clock here and it ends at eleven o'clock at night in Vegas, it's like it starts at four in the afternoon. We'll watch the game, then we'll grab dinner. Like God, I miss that. I, I'm, and I'm still enjoying that. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> hey, so you wrote some books, uh, designing yeah. your own destiny, correct? The Winner's Code: Secrets of the Winner's Mindset, and then you wrote Launch, right? Correct. The A to Z. In creating a successful business, correct. I'm still working on one. Was there any moments during the writing process when it didn't seem like you'd ever uh, finish writing it? And if so, how did you like push through that writer's block? Well, there was a fourth book that I wrote that came up uh, before de- uh, Designing Your Own Destiny, and it was called Lease Options Made Easy. Uh, and, and the subtitle was uh, How to Buy How to Buy How to Buy a Home with Little No or Bad Credit. Which is all about lease office. I don't put that in my signatures on my emails. I don't promote that one uh, too much, even though it is my first book. However, that came out in 2015. And at that time, I wanted to become an author. And what I ended up doing with that book, and then I'll answer your question. What I wanted to do with that book, you know, I just wanted it to come out. Now, now on my website back then, I had a, a an FAQ. I, had, I think 39 uh, questions and answers uh, for frequently asked questions. And that that FAQ became the template of my book, of my first book. Now I must admit, and I will admit this: when I wrote that first uh, the, the, that first draft of that book, it was garbage. Oh my god, it's so boring. <laughs> so I decided I would actually make it a, a narrative. So I, I so I created two characters, a husband wife character, which had bad credit, and they were about to go to a, a, a seminar on on lease option real estate. So there was a third character, the speaker as well. And what I wanted to do is was talk about different things as far as the lease option is concerned, you know, financing stuff like that. But but having the husband and the wife have different perspectives on it. So therefore, I was just, therefore I was able to instead of just giving a factual book that would just give you like one perspective, I was able to give two perspectives because I, I, I wrote a factual book as a narrative. Now, I, I still don't think it's the best uh, uh, the best work that I've done. So my second book, uh, Designing Your Own Destiny, I actually hired a, a book writing coach uh, named Patrick, and he was in Hawaii, 
and I ended up uh, hiring him and he gave me uh, some uh, templates and, and principles on how to write a book. And I used that one to write that second book. And that book took me a year to write because, I mean, I was still new to the writing process. And some of the secrets that he talked about, if you're writing a factual book, is number one, um, because a lot of a lot of books, you're going to have stories in them. And uh, even the, you know, the getting arrested story is, is in the, is in that, is in that book. Um, and he said, basically just, you know, write down you know, all the stories, write, write down a hundred stories, 110 stories. And then that does either happen to you or happen to people that you know. And then he says, and then make sure that at least, that at least uh, no more than 49% of the stories that you're going to be telling are about yourself. Because if you go over 49%, then it becomes an autobiography. So don't make it an autobiography. <laughs> so you have to be lear- learning lessons that you learn from other people. Right. And uh, so, and, and then, so I wrote those down and then he says, okay, we well, you know what is, what is the book about the topic of the book? Then write down, he says, uh, uh, how many chapters are you going to be in the book? So you figure out how many chapters you want in your book. And, he, and then basically what he said was, uh, he said, uh, my second book was t- uh, 22 chapters. So I got out 23 pieces of paper, you know, uh, you know, uh, copy paper or, or, or printer paper. I wrote the title or the working title on, on the front of the, of the, on the first page, and then the name of the chapters on the, uh, on those other 22 pages. And then I got the stories that I had in there. This is like, this is chapter 15. This is chapter 12. This is chapter nine. This is chapter 22. And then, so now you've got your basic outline for your book. And then after that, and then he would say, then go ahead and, and write that book. You know, go ahead and, and write that first draft. Now, here's the here's the kicker. And this is why a lot of people fail at writing a book. He says, and I, I fully believe him. Uh, he said, whenever you write your book, go ahead and, and, and write it, you know, write the, you know, based upon your outline and just write and write and write because don't correct any errors. Don't go back and ch- look at chapter one. You write on all the way until the very end. And he's going to, and, he, and what he said was, this is going to be the biggest piece of crap anybody has seen. You're not going to show it to anybody. But the thing is, you've got your first draft done. Once you have the first draft done, print it. And I suggest you have page numbers turned on. Print it because <laughs> you don't want to have a hundred page book and all of a sudden your, your your papers get out of order. So make sure you stay <laughs> page numbers turned on. Subtle hit. Uh, um, learn from experience, and, uh, and then you then you started uh, editing it. So my first book, I, I it went through four drafts. I, I and I still have all four drafts. Right. A printed drafts that is right. And, right, right, right. and then I hired a a, a, a content editor. And, and it went through four more drafts with him. So, I mean, it went through, this is why it took so long to write the book. Uh, because I was, you know, I was going through that, to through that much detail. Now, my book was also a workbook. And um, and then, uh, and when I write books, uh, my second and fourth one is, uh, particularly, uh, which are both workbooks, I always want to do something different that nobody has ever done before, or at least most likely has never done before. So it's, hot, it's a way to be unique. And you know, like in most uh, personal growth, most uh, personal development books, people have quotes at the very beginning of the chapter, and sometimes they have other quotes throughout the chapter. But you know, at the very, you have the title of the chapter, you have a quote, and then you have the, then you go into the uh, uh, into the material. Yes. Okay. So most quotes that quotes that people use are going to be quotes that are uh, either by you know they they were like say, they're going to be a Gandhi quote, or they're going to be a Walt Disney quote, or they're going to be you know somebody like that. And usually when you read quotes, now we understand through our five senses, our three main senses that we learn from are our eyes, which is visual, our auditory or t- touching, which is kinesthetic. Well, most quotes are going to be feeling based. They're going to be uh, kinesthetic based. And when I wrote uh, Designing Your Own Destiny, I said, you know what? I want quotes to have a visual, an auditory and a, a feeling based. So all the quotes in my book, with the exception of maybe one, and there's quite a few in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all all the quotes in the book were quoted by someone that did not exist. What does that mean? Quoted by someone that did not exist? You just made them up? No, uh, they were all movie quotes. So the very first quote in the book is the red pill, blue pill quote from the Matrix. So when you read the quote, you not only do you get a good the quote is good, but maybe you're you're, you're listening like, and you're thinking, oh, this I'm hearing Lawrence Fishburne in my head. 
Yep. And I've seen that scene in my head. The hardest part was there's two chapters that took me almost two months to come up with a quote for it. It's like this, this chapter is on this topic. I've got to find a, to- a quote, a movie quote that people will know based upon that chapter. Like there, there was one quote, one of my other favorite ones in the movie uh, with, uh, I was out of one of the uh, Batman uh, movies. And it's a quote by the Joker. And he says, this is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an unmovable object. Yeah. Remember that too. <laughs> Yeah, that's when Batman was on the motorcycle, you know, racing towards the Joker. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a great strategy. And you got that strategy from your uh, coach. The strategy of writing the book came from the coach. The, the, having the movie quotes was my own strategy. My man, I got you. As well as how I got my testimonials was my own strategy. Let me ask you this. How do you get a, a testimonial for a book before the book is ever uh, printed? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Like. Oh, as I think, well, I'll even give your listeners and even yourself, uh, uh, basically, how I how I got most of my testimonials before my book was even uh, published. It was I, I would instead of having somebody read a twenty two chapter book, it's going to be like two hundred and fifty some odd pages long. I went and actually found uh, ten friends and says, and I was, and I would say, uh, like say you, Lee, I say, hey, hey, Lee, you're you're my friend here. Uh, I want I want to get a testimonial from you if you don't mind. And you as my friend, so of course I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. I go, okay, I'm going to send you to chapters 1, 11, and 13. Could you give me a testimony on those three chapters? And then you say, yes, you will. And then I'll go to my friend Noah. I go, hey, Noah, uh, I'd like to get a testimonial. Would you read chapters 1, 12, and, and 19 and, and give me a testimonial? So I, I what I ended up doing, I, I contacted like 12 friends. Um, I sent the same three chapters uh, to, to I always send it uh, to, to, to two uh, to two people, but I, I, I mixed it up as far as you know, uh, as far as the next set of two. So therefore, they're giving me a testimonials on what they've read. That if I accept them the, the, all the same chapters, they're going to give me the same testimonial uh, for the most part. So I said, let me mix it up a little bit, and that, that's how that's how I got all my testimonials. That's how I do all my testimonials now. I, I just need to write the book. And get some chapters so I can get them out to my friends, and I'll, I'll give you a call when that time comes. <laughs> well, I want to give you a, another little uh, piece of advice now. I mean, there, there's this tool that you could use to help you at least get get your outline of your book. It's called Chat GPT. Yeah, I got, I got the outline. I got everything down um, for the most part, and it's just it's just about filling in the meat. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So that's that's where I'm at right now. Um, well, that's that's what I mean by just going cre- create that first draft. That's yeah. the best. The- and, and, and here's another thing. Um, and uh, I came up with this myself. I think I don't think I heard it. If you are uh, uh, the, the word author, do you know what word is derived from? Which English word is derived from? No. Which one? Authority. Mm-hmm. You're an authority on a certain. Uh huh. You're an authority on a certain t- topic. So if you want to stand out in your business, having a book is one of the best ways to do that. Because let me let me ask you this: If I told you I did lease options, and uh, and then my friend Bob he says he does lease options as well, and you've heard that we both do a good job, and I say, and I tell you I have a book, and that's all that you know, and it's assumed the book has good content. Who do you trust more? Right, person with the book. Because they're an authority. So those are good tips. And we're going to let's talk. Let's focus right here. Let me stop real quick and reiterate. Uh, one strategy to help you out is to get you a coach to help write with the, the write the outline and just get your thoughts together. Right. Is to maybe utilize the chat GPT tool and then also understand that as a business owner or as a, uh, you know, brand ambassador or whatever it is that you're doing, uh, writing a book, uh, being an author of a book makes you an authority on a certain topic, right? Specifically the topic that you're focusing on in the book. So these are, these are excellent points to consider (laughs) Kevin, uh, when you're definitely, when you're a small business owner or a big business owner, whatever it is you're trying to do. Right. And the thing is, you're not, you're not writing the book necessarily to uh, make money uh, off of the book itself. You want to make money from the book, not off the book. And there's a big difference by having a book uh, a from, you know, uh, making money from the book, you can give your book away for free as a free lead magnet for somebody signing up for one of your courses. All right. So now I'm going to ste- step out of the book writing thing and I'm going to actually talk sure. about you helping. So as someone who helps entrepreneurs avoid pitfalls, what's one or two common or uncommon mistakes that you see 
us small business owners make repeatedly and what advice do you offer based on your own experiences? Well, I mean, some of the biggest things I see is uh, is not having the right uh, uh, attitude uh, because being an entrepreneur is not meaning uh, that you're a nine to fiver. It, it means you're not a nine to fiver anymore. This means that you don't have a boss anymore. That, and therefore, this means that um, you, you have to go and get your own lead. You're going to have to go and get your own uh, generation. Even if you're a real estate agent and you have a broker, you're still your own business. Um, so the thing is, is having that right mentality is is is, is, a, is a huge mindset thing. Because um, a lot of a lot of uh, reasons I see people fail is because they is, is because they, they're, they're, just, they're just not thinking like an entrepreneur. Um, now, when I was in uh, in Las Vegas as a realtor, as an example, um, Las Las Vegas is a very service oriented town. Yeah, so you know, I would say probably twenty percent, twenty five percent of what it does it offers services, and then everybody else has a regular day job. They work at the grocery store. They, you know, they do whatever. But because it's so high service oriented, a real estate agent has to be available seven days a week. Because you've got to, you show houses on the weekends uh, for your your regular day uh, job people, and then you show houses during the week for all your uh, people that work. You know the the, uh, the dancers, the bartenders, the uh, the valets, uh, all of those people. Because you know they're they they're working the weekends. That's where that's where all the tourists are in town. So you have you have to adopt a a, a mindset that you are running a business, no matter what that business is. Um, and the second thing is, 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 is also a, more of a time management thing. It's being able to uh, know how, how long things are going to take. And also my biggest pet peeve, uh, and, uh, and, I, I, and I learned this as, as, a, as, as a child, is uh, never be late for your appointments, ever. I mean, if you're going to be somewhere at, at 2 o'clock and it takes you 30 minutes to get there, well, you should be leaving by 1.15. No matter what it is, I mean, it's better that you that, that you're sitting in your car because you got got early, and your client or potential client is sitting in their car, and let's say in, in in Las Vegas, 115 degree temperatures, waiting for you to show up because you you always show up 10 minutes late. Yeah, I know. Uh, one of the lessons we learned in the army is if you're early, you're on time, and if you're on time, you're late. I think. Well, this Barty's quote, I think, was if you're 15 minutes early, you're late. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hey, so let's let's have a little bit of fun. Um, sure. And it, 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 it's it's fun for us at your expense. OK, so so if you could travel back in time to any failure that you encountered, not to change the outcome, but to have a good laugh and learn uh, which failure would it be and And why would you choose that one? I mean, I mean, I don't know why this is coming to mind. I remember I was uh, le- learning how to rollerblade, <laughs> and, and the thing was, I was learning how to do it, and, and I was wanting to try to impress somebody uh, that that I was like you were saying, I was going to, sh- I was showing off, and then all of a sudden I realized uh, there was a person that uh, was suddenly in front of me that was walking their dog, and the dog was on the other side of the sidewalk than they were, the, the, than they were. And well, by the way, there was a leash in between those two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <shoot. laughs> so yeah, I bit, I bit, uh, bit the dust. <laughs> how, how did you? How did you feel? Do you remember? How did you feel at that moment? Oh, I was like, just humiliated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. End of the world. This is the end of the world. I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> and there, was, and this reminds me even of another time when I was a kid. Uh, I, 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 I think my brother was with me, and I was riding my bicycle really, really, really fast. And then I said, well, I, well, I've got to stop. And I forgot which one is the front brake, which was the back brake. <laughs> oh, Lord. So I, I squeezed the right hand one. And I, I only squeezed the right hand one. And so that that we were locked, but I still had my, my momentum going. So that I ended up uh, going, uh, going you know, flipping over the handlebars, landed on the ground face down, and the bicycle landed on top of me with the wheels still up in the air. Oh. <laughs> so... <that's, laughs> so- you know, the key to hold this whole thing is, you know, we all go through life and we all have these embarrassing moments or some things that just didn't go out the way we, we you know, planned them to go out right in our heads. But that's that's not the end of the story. Right. So as long as you're still going, as long as you're still kicking. Right. Just keep trying those things and you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure out what it is that you need to be doing or should be doing. Right. And don't beat yourself up too much. So I got another question for you because I read this and I kind of I want to understand your, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you gauge this? You're striving 
to guide 1,000 entrepreneurs, is it 1,000, to six-figure success and beyond. Why 1,000? Where are you at in that number? And what do you do once you do all 1,000? Do you make another goal? Of course. Uh, the thing is, uh, uh, with goal setting, once you achieve, one of the happiest days of your life should be when you achieve your goal, and the saddest day should also be that same day because now, now you now, now you're there, uh, and, and and then uh, and then uh, what's next? Uh, why a thousand? Because I, as I, uh, I'm building this business, I wanted to give myself something tangible, because mm-hmm. I'm not the person that's going to say. Um, I, I want to make two hundred fifty thousand uh, uh, dollars in, uh, in this endeavor. I'm the one that's going to say if to, if I get two if I get eighty people to invest three thousand uh, dollars into this uh, into this event, then I'm at I'm basically right at that two hundred fifty thousand dollar mark. But I would rather focus on getting those eighty people uh, uh, getting success, and then I would get su- success just as a result because of it. So I would rather, instead of having a, a personal monetary goal for myself, I'd rather have a tangible goal that I can I work with. Now, I will say that the idea came from, I don't know if you know a gentleman by the name of Robert Allen? No, I don't. Uh, he's a, 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 uh, he was a, a real estate uh, mogul, and uh, um, he, he was the one that, uh, what was it, uh, Multiple Streams of Income, I think was his book. And uh, and one of the things he was, he wanted to help a uh, hundred or ten thousand people to become millionaires. So uh, so right now I'm not at that at that level. However, I rather uh, go after something that is that is more realistic. And helping a thousand become uh, to make a hundred thousand dollars a year um, to me is a, is a very realistic goal. I'm not the one that's going to say I'm going to make you a millionaire. I'm going to do all there. No, I rather I, if you're running a business and you're making twenty, twenty five, thirty, thirty five thousand dollars, let's get let's get you on that path to get into that hundred thousand. Right. So that's I mean I rather have has something that's realistic for people to achieve. Yeah. Because yeah, absolutely. I mean, was it was it thirty three percent of all businesses fail in the first two years? Is that the, is that the statistic? Yeah, thirty three percent of all businesses fail in the first two years. Twenty percent fail in the first year. So I'd rather focus on those people that are that might be um, barely getting by. Let's let's uh, let's create an, an additional income stream for you. I've exhausted uh, my questions right now, and I just want to ask you: Is there anything else you'd like to discuss that we haven't talked about? I mean, the thing is, if you've got a, a dream and you really want to go after it, and I'm talking business wise, um, start going after that dream, even if it's just doing tiny parts uh, of achieving it and and then set yourself a goal, you know, a realistic goal. And then if you if you hit that goal, then you've got proof of concept. If you got proof of concept, then you then you can work on that to improve upon it. And this is what I do when I work with uh, uh, with my uh, um, uh, my clients. Is you know, let's go and start doing some gold. Let's start getting you some success, so that you can start feeling like, hey, okay, I am accomplishing something. So go if, and even if you've got a job right now, um, I'm all about being in the gray. There's no there's no there's no black and white, or you have to do one or the other. Uh, what I tell people, because uh, you know, I do, I've worked with a lot of startups. Is if you know if you've got yourself a day job and you go out there and you uh, start a new business, this does not mean you have to quit your day job. Do the, uh, do them both together. The, the the your your side hustle will be you know, what you're bringing in some income, and then what I tell them and what you, if your side hustle or your or your self employed uh, business hits this uh, and you hit the same level of income that you have at your job, then you can make a decision as to what you want to do next. Do you stay at your job? Do you quit your job? Do you go part time? Because the last thing I would ever tell anybody, and, and Lee, you know this, uh, if you were uh, twenty years uh, in the military and you're nineteen year, or you're, you know, you're going to retire at twenty years and you're nineteen and a half years in, and all of a sudden you start making, you just you won the lottery, or or you or you started a, a business, would you just quit the army? You know, with with uh, six months to go or three months to go? No, sir. No, so it's, it's not a black and white thing. It's, and the thing is, don't look at this as black and white. Um, look at it as gray. And your gray is going to be different than my gray. Go Army. No. <laughs> Go Navy. I, I got to throw that in there, right? Especially since I see you're a fan of football. You're talking about the different time zones. 
But Kevin, yeah, I missed Pacific Time Zone. I missed Pacific Time Zone. <laughs> oh man, and I love it. I love being able to get up at ten o'clock in the morning and start watching NFL football. And then when they're playing overseas, good lord, that's like six in the morning, right? So I love that you can watch football and then have the rest of your day. That's amazing, and, and that's something I I do miss. And and, and that's what thing. That's what even within anything, like if I don't want to watch the nine o'clock news uh, here, it's at nine o'clock out there. It's, it's six o'clock, and then I can go have dinner. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the nine o'clock news out, out in the Pacific is is a repeat of the six o'clock news. <laughs> it takes some changes, though. I mean, it, it takes some adjusting too. So I know when I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, it was you know some whatevers. But what what was the defining the defining thing that made me absolutely love it is exactly what you were speaking to, football Sunday, right? <laughs> and just being able to get up early in the morning is like this. This trumps everything. Uh, well, so the, the, I'm a Green Bay Packers fan, and, and uh, at the time of, of this recording, yeah, the, uh, we were. I was watching. A, a, uh, I wanted to watch a preseason game, but I, I don't think the game started until nine o'clock at night. Like, dude, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say. So you name and names now. I'm a, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. So okay. uh, let me let me put that out there as well. Oh, ain't no sorry. We about to put it to y'all this year. No. <laughs> Hey, we've got a new quarterback, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but Kevin, thank you for joining me on Hindsight, the podcast, and for sharing your journey, right? It, it's pretty amazing. Uh, thanks for the tips on, on the writing experience, right? And then also some of those things to look out for in our entre- entrepreneurial experience. Uh, your insights will undoubtedly resonate with our listeners and you know, as they navigate their own paths, right? Because everything is a little different. It's not black and white, right? But you can take those tips that you provided and put them and apply them as needed. And I really appreciate that. And best of luck to you. Do you got a new book coming out? Uh, no, not at the moment. I'm, I'm creating a lot of online courses. Uh, my, my, uh, at the time of this recording, my last course that I released was called uh, Become a Self-Published Author. By the way, it is it, it is available on our, on our website. <laughs> but, hey, oh, one thing I forgot, where can the listeners find you if they want to know more about what you're doing or how, if they want to connect with you? Uh, where do they go? Well, the best place for them to go is our website because I do have, a, have a, a lot of our links on there. And that website is Optimal Performance Academy. You probably heard that at the very beginning. OptimalPerformanceAcademy.org.org. Not .com, but uh, .org. And on there, you will uh, see that you can schedule a 30-minute discovery call where we can actually talk about you and your business. That is complimentary. And if you and if we decide we want to work together, then we'll work together in, in some capacity. I do have all my online uh, courses on there as well. And I also have uh, links to my upcoming workshops, my, uh, my upcoming webinars, as well as my uh, virtual uh, trainings as well. All of that is on our website. There you go. Optimal Performance Academy dot org org thanks Correct. again kevin and best of luck with with all your future actually your current and your future endeavors and we'll be in touch okay thank you very much lee have a good day you too thanks for tuning in to hindsight the podcast i hope you enjoyed this episode i know i did and don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay updated on future episodes packed with inspiring stories before you go leave me a message with your thoughts feedback, or suggestions for future topics. And if you're loving what you hear, please take a moment to rate this episode. Your feedback helps me to grow and reach more listeners just like you. So remember, life's a journey. Stay tuned, stay curious, and keep gaining wisdom through the power of hindsight. Until next time. Oh, and don't forget, subscribe, leave a message, and rate this episode. When you look back in hindsight, everything is 2020 and high.